there. Now, I, I reached a point where I didn't want to be there anymore, but like I said, most of it was just because I just was tired of explaining my blackness and explaining who I was, you know, and just trying to help the black students who were there. And there was this battle, you know, um, kind of internally of, am I black enough? Like, and then I would, you know, hang out with my friends on the outside or my friends at church. And, you know, like, oh, you sound white. Hello, everyone. My name is Walt, and I'm the host of Boss Locks, a show where we are redefining professionalism, elevating Black voices, and proving that natural hair and professionalism do coexist. And we're doing this by speaking with Black leaders, CEOs, professionals, and just some really dope people who are doing some amazing things. Now, today, I have the honor and privilege of speaking with Ronika Jacobs. Ronika, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you, Walt? I'm doing really good. Really good. You know, it's it's like, well, I mean, it's not early in the morning anymore, but <laughs> I woke up feeling like fresh and rejuvenated. It's kind of different because I didn't even sleep that well like last night, but for some reason I just woke up. So I think I was like, knew I was ready for this episode. And I was like, yeah, let's get it. So yeah. Absolutely. Because you're ready to, <laughs> ready to strive for more. Ready to strive for more. That's right. That's right. And good swag way for, you know, for those who don't know, Renika is an educator, but also a host of this really cool show called Strive for More. And it's a show that it really just encompasses a lot of different things from like self-care, personal development, get some career and entrepreneurial device, some for people who've been in the game forever, and just all around topics about people wanting to make that true transformation within themselves to achieve their, you know, their maximum potential. So you know, I have a lot of questions to ask you because, you know, you're a little bit more ahead of me in the podcasting journey. I'm just really curious about everything that you do. But to start it all off, I have just one question for you. What are the three things that most people don't know about you? Ah, three things. Well, first of all, before I answer those questions, I just want to say thank you to your audience for tuning in to us today. Uh, and, you know, there are lots of things that they could be doing, right? We know that, but they've take, they are That's taking right. the time right now to sit here and spend a little time and hear us speak to each other. So uh, we really, I really appreciate that. And, uh, you know, so, but the three things that people don't know about me. Uh, so, <laughs> um, <laughs> so on the outside, uh, people see me as a person that's totally well put together. Um, I am a systems girl. So, um, it, and I, and I'm systems, I'm a systems girl through and through. Um, but what people don't know about me is in my personal life, like I'm super like eclectic <laughs> and I'm super like, I'll try anything. I'm a risk taker. I've got six tattoos. <laughs> so no one would ever guess that. Um, I love tattoos. Um, another thing that people would never think about me uh, to, to that I would even um is that I um, I'm a sneakerhead, <laughs> so oh, yeah. I love. I mean, I love shoes. <laughs> I love shoes. Period. Um, but uh, Air Force Ones, LeBrons, uh, Jordans, Harachis, you name it, I've got them. <laughs> uh, oh, All Star, <laughs> like Pumas, I've got them all. Like any shoe that I mean, and I am addicted to shoes. Um, I also have lots of heels and boots, but um, I am a big sneakerhead. So, uh, but in my professional life, I don't really get to wear sneakers that much. But on jean days, when we wear sneakers, and I'm in the hallways with the students, and I have my sneakers on, and the kids are always like, "Man, Miss Jacobs, that's so dope! You got like the days." <laughs> so, because they're so used to me wearing suits. <laughs> So, right. um, and then on jeans and I have J's and I rock my J's and especially if I have like, you know, I don't know, some like throwbacks and they're like, what? You know, so, uh, and the third thing, man, um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of a third thing that people don't know about me. Um, I think people assume I'm a control freak because I have things together all the time, like, you know, and I'm organized and have kind of a methodical way of doing things. But honestly, like, if I give a directive to somebody, I just need the end result. That's it. I'm not a micromanager. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to tell you, like, if I tell you, hey, meet me 
at this location, I'm not going to tell you how to get there. I'm not going to tell you the best way to get there. Um, I just need you to show up and I just need you to show up at the time I need you to be there. <laughs> That's kind of <laughs> it. So tattoos, sneakers, and uh, I'm not trying to control you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. I like those three. That was a pretty cool little collection. <laughs> so uh, would you... You know, when you say like you take risks and everything, the first thing that I thought of, I don't know why, but the very first thing I thought of was Will Smith's 50th birthday when he did that skydiving thing. Is right. that something that you would do? Okay, so no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so not that risky. Uh, I'll play with my life. <laughs> I'm a mom. <laughs> I got people that depend on me. <laughs> right. Who's going to so, take care like, of your sneakers? Uh, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not like swimming with sharks. Uh, I'm not jumping out of planes. Uh, I'm not, uh, there, I'm a calculated risk taker. So how about that? Mm. Um, but, uh, I'll try anything once, uh, as long as I feel comfortable and I know, um, that I'm hopefully not going to lose my life. Uh, <laughs> so that's the thing. Um, you know, I just turned 40 last month and, uh, happy, you know, I, well, happy super yeah, belated. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I just, you know, thank you. I, I just was so excited this year, right? It's 2020. Uh, you know, it's like the, the 2020 is the year of clear vision, right? And I was like, yeah, you know, I've had all the things in my past. I'm 40 now. And I was so excited. And I was going to just, you know, go on an amazing trip to, you know, Africa. I was going to go to Morocco. And then I was going to go to mm -hmm. Spain. I just was just all excited. I was planning all this. And then COVID happened, right? So, so that knocked all those plans. Um, so I ended up just doing a low-key birthday. But... Um, so now I got to figure out what I'm going to do for my 41st birthday <laughs> to do something right. really awesome. Um, you know, uh, I like traveling. I miss it so, so much. Um, I just like going to, you know, and so I feel like that's a risk, right? To go somewhere um, that you've never been um, and just meet the people and understand the culture. Um, I do speak fluent Spanish, so that, that wouldn't have been a big problem to go to Spain. Um, but just, you know, just knowing uh, that you could just experience something different, um, different than what you normally do on a day to day basis. Because when you start looking at other people and how they live, it really gives you a different perspective on on your own life. Very true. Yeah, I know. Um, well, I, I went out to the country in Mexico, but it was like for an hour and it was in this kind of controlled environment. So I don't even really count that, but I did get to go to China and that was a complete uh, change in my perspective. I feel like when I went there and came back, I had more of like a 360 type of vision to be able to see from a lot of different lifestyles. And one thing that's interesting is like when you go to yes. see a lot of similarities on how you live that you would have normally thought was yeah. like living over there is just crazy and insane and all that stuff. But it's, it's not that bad for the most part, as far as like traveling and everything. Um, where, where have, where all have you traveled outside the country? Um, let's see. Uh, I'm a, I'm a beach girl. So any beach that I could find, I'm there. <laughs> I <feel you. laughs> so I've been to, yes, I've been to Aruba. I've been to Belize. I've been to, of course, Mexico, going to Cozumel, Cancun. Um, I'm trying to think anywhere else. Of course, I've been on the, the Texas coast and um, all different types of places and beaches on the Texas coast because I'm in Texas. Um, and then, of course, I've been to lots of states within the United States. And um, so really, I've pretty much been around the kind of continental U.S. Um, and then North America, South America. Uh, haven't quite ventured too much into South America, but Central America, definitely. And uh, Canada. So um, <clears throat> that's pretty much it. So I, I like I said, I was really excited to be to looking forward to my trip to fly over to the motherland and, and, and right. hit Spain. Uh, but that's OK. It's not totally out. You know, uh, hopefully all of this won't last forever and we'll get through this and uh, everything has a season. So we'll get through this and then, hey, I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. Yeah. I was telling some people like I'm in Atlanta and I love living here, but as soon as I'm able to, I need to get out. Just been here, like just need to get out, out. And so, yeah, I definitely feel you. Me and my girlfriend, we've been talking about going to Ghana for a while. And so yes. yeah, definitely, definitely got to get out, see the motherland and just be Absolutely. outside the house in general. I'd be happy anywhere, but definitely Ghana. 
Yeah. Well, my dream trip. So during the uh, during COVID and the quarantine and when everybody like was on lockdown. So I did travel. So, you know, YouTube <laughs> is such a great source <laughs> of all kinds of stuff. So my kids and I, uh, we we traveled. We, we went to all kinds of places like we went to Seychelles. I don't know if anybody have ever heard of Seychelles, but it's an island off the um, off the coast of Africa, kind of not too far from Madagascar, the island of Madagascar. But it's an island. Beautiful place. Beautiful people. Um, uh, and so, you know, we did there. We went to Thailand. We went to Singapore. <laughs> we went all kinds of places. We went to Kenya. We went on an African safari. <laughs> you know, so we were just like typing in. I was like, nah, we 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 can still travel. I mean, we went into, you know, we, we, uh, I think, oh, yeah, we went to Rome. Uh, we went to Paris. So we were everywhere. <laughs> we went to Venice. So I was just typing in kind of stuff because there are some really cool people that have all of these great shows on YouTube and they, you know, film their travel. So, you know, even if if you can't make it there physically, you can make it there virtually because, right, that's what we've been doing lately is mm -hmm. all this virtual stuff. So it was actually really fun, you know. We have to try that out. What was it? So I know like Google has that, um, what is it? Well, actually, I think it's like some type of Google Goggles thing where you kind of take tours and museums and stuff. Was it kind of yes, like that? Yes, yes. Yes. No, okay. it's actually like you just type in like this, the country that you want to visit into YouTube in the search bar. And there are people who have gone to these places and they document their journey to these places, like from the airport to, to the hotel. And man, it's some nice hotels out there, really nice resorts out there. So, yeah, um, yeah no, Absolutely. YouTube is great. <laughs> I'm just giving yeah. a major plug for YouTube, but <laughs> oh yeah, all right. <laughs> We're gonna we'll reach out to the YouTube people, get a check from them. I'll split it with right. <laughs> you. Yeah, I got you. I got you. So you say you spoke fluent Spanish, and yeah, I think that's so awesome because I feel like everyone has taken Spanish at some point in school, including myself. Go around a lot of people. I played soccer, so I was like in high school mostly. A lot of people spoke Spanish, and I felt pretty comfortable having a nice, boring conversation with people. But over the years, you know, I've definitely lost the touch. I've tried Duolingo, but for whatever reason, I just can't keep up with it. But so I just want to applaud you for being able to speak fluent Spanish. And I'm also curious, Thank like, you. how did you do it? Gracias. <laughs> and I guess that's another thing people it. don't know about me seeing me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, honestly, well, I think the language chose me. Um, I, I have spoken Spanish my whole entire life. I don't really remember not speaking Spanish. I dream in Spanish. It's, it's really, oh, it's really, really interesting. I do. I do. Occasionally I do. Um, and even coming home, um, I, I sometimes have to kind of code switch and just, you know, I want to say something and I have to think about okay, what I'm trying to say, um, because in education, especially being in Texas and I'm in Houston. So there are um, several campuses that I've worked at and schools that I've worked at where, you know, they've been either bilingual campuses where, you know, most of the student population speaks Spanish. And I've always also been in, in the ESL, which is English as a second language department. And so that causes me to speak Spanish. Um, but as, as far as, uh, and as I can remember, um, my mother, she was a bilingual kindergarten teacher and she was the English teacher, though, um, a, a part of the program. But this is in early 80s when they first started doing like bilingual programs um, in Texas. So it's just, you know, really amazing that I just, 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 I guess, like I said, the language chose me. And so I, I've spoken it. I did take Spanish in school. I went to private schools. And so Spanish was a part of the curriculum. So I guess that, that's the early part of dual language. <laughs> so, right. Um, right. yeah, so I took Spanish all the way up through high school, you know, so I was like in Spanish six, six or seven, you know, so to where I was like writing papers um, in Spanish. And, uh, and like, you know, when I entered the to, into the classroom, like there was no English at all um, that was allowed to be spoken. Um, so, so not just learning the language, but just actually, actually learning academically how to speak Spanish. So I read, write, and I can understand uh, Spanish very well. That is so cool. Yeah. Wow. That actually uh, reminds me of, D um, you know who D Smoke is? Yes. Yes, I heard of him. <laughs> yeah. 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 He was on that. Uh, the, rap the uh, hustle and or not hustle oh wow rhythm and flow rhythm and flow yes yes yeah 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 and like he really like he was one person so like just 
hearing him just so effortlessly go back between English and Spanish and his raps, I was like, yo, that's crazy. It really like reminded me, you know what? I definitely yeah. want to be able to do that. Cause I feel like once you're able to speak another language, you just increase the opportunities for being able to read people. And that's especially great in education because why try to hide that you can speak Spanish when, I mean, that's, that's cool. You can speak Spanish and if you speak both, that's pretty dope too. And it's like, um, it's almost like being able to, as a student, be able to go to school where you're just learning and yeah. whether you're an immigrant or not born here or not, be able to go into a place learning and people who are teaching you are speaking the same language as you. I feel that's really impactful really strong so yeah so what, what exactly you say you're in the ESL department um but what is are you a teacher or are you a part of the school district like what's your role at the school <laughs> well, I, I'm an assistant principal uh okay. but I, I have been of course a teacher of course you have to be a teacher first before you can be an All assistant right. principal but uh, I've been a teacher I've been um a um in, uh, instructional specialist, a curriculum coach uh, for English as a second language. Um, I've been a newcomer teacher, which I teach students brand new to the United States from all over the world. They come to the United States, they don't speak a word of English. And so I get them through a proficiency, a certain proficiency level um, from the beginning of the year or whenever they come into the school to the end of the year and teaching them Spanish and teaching them and help, helping them acclimate into our school system. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, I've been um, a language development teacher. So um, where I would go and pick up students from their classroom, kind of same type of thing um, and help them to develop their English language and be able to function in class and understand and comprehend what's going on. Uh, and then I've been a, a I mean, I've done so many different things. I've been a consultant, <laughs> so oh, uh, really? a lot. Of, so, but my favorite at this point so far is probably assistant principal. So, for now, <laughs> right, that's cool. So, how has this um, this like going back to school during COVID? Like, what has it been like for you and your school? Oh, stressful. <laughs> very, very, very stressful. So for our district, um, you know, it's hard to figure out what's the right thing to do. Um, we want to protect the students, right? Um, but there is a pandemic going on. And at the same time, we also wanna make sure that we're protecting our staff. And so I, I feel for all superintendents out there trying to make those decisions um, because you don't want to make the wrong one, <laughs> right? Um, and then, you know, for us, for my principal and I, we're, you know, at campus leadership and just, you know, we're right there, boots on the ground. And so we're getting all the feedback um, from parents who are nervous, who are scared. Um, we are not face to face right now. We are virtual, um, but just even trying to support parents and children who are logging on on a date logging on on a daily basis for their assignments and trying to get people you know to log on on time to stay engaged uh they're elementary they're young and you know to sit on a computer with your teacher all day long it's difficult for them you know they're already moving around in the class physically <laughs> you know so now we're asking them to sit down and be still and watch a computer screen <laughs> and then do work Whereas they're used to, um, you know, the teacher being right there next to them and being able to take their pencil and, you know, write. And I mean, even I was thinking about that. I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, when teachers, we, when we do come back face to face, um, we won't even be able to do things like that. Like we won't even be able to take their pencil and work with them. And um, it, it's just it, it's stressful, <laughs> you know, and it's it's you're we're having to have you should already be a leader who is um, very empathetic but now more than ever because you know as our teachers are coming they're also they have their own families to worry about they have their own people who have been affected by the pandemic right or they've been affected by the p pandemic personally themselves if they if they contract contracted COVID or whatever um during the spring or over the summer 
And then there's this, you know, scare, like we can't meet face to face because if we do meet face to face, then there's a there's a risk there. Right. Um, and you don't want to be that campus that ends up having that risk um, that now your whole campus is shut down because somebody, you know, tested positive. But we do have measures in place. I think my district has done a great, great job of um, preparing us and um, we do a self screener every morning um, before we enter the building and um, that's a system that they have put in place and then of course as campus leadership through my principal and I and our counselor we just make sure that you know everybody's filled out that self screener every morning before they come into the building and we're very diligent about that. Um, and so for the students, when they come back, you know, we're going to ask that the parents fill out the screener, you know, and different, just, just being aware, right? Just being aware. And so there's been lots of training um, to identify, you know, different symptoms that we can see and, um, and just observing the rules, just, you know, being six feet apart, wearing your mask. Um, we have face shields because, you know, that's, people can see our faces because it's kind of hard um, being in that environment um, every day and you have the mask on and you're trying to talk. It's hard to judge emotions and facial expressions, <laughs> you know. Um, I've caught myself sometimes I have a mask on and I want to whisper, you know, how you talk. You, I'm like, they can't even they don't even know what I'm saying because they can't even read my <laughs> So I'm like, ugh. Uh, so, but you know, I have a really cool face shield now so you can see my face, uh, you know, when I'm talking to people and I love that better. But then I'll make you laugh, well, so the face shield is clear, right? So the thing about the face shield is I forget I have it. And so I have a drink, right? And I want to take like a swig of water. And so I take the water, right? And I'm just talking and I'm like trying to drink the water and I can't because I forget I got the face shield on. So just in this those embarrassing moments. <laughs> Yo, that's funny. <laughs> Man. Yo, well, shout out to you and your school district because it sounds like you guys are taking the right steps to make sure everyone's safe and still able to learn the best they can. I know like yeah. here in Georgia, it's not the case. It's like, I mean, you don't go do what you do. So it's really cool. <laughs> yeah, you guys are, um, yeah, man. Yeah. Cause, uh, y'all's mayor, that's my Sarah. Like, I need, like, y'all need to leave my Sarah alone. She working hard. <laughs> right? She's working hard. Mm hmm. Yeah, man. Shout out to Mayor Keisha Lance Bottom. She's out here. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, yeah. if I get it sued, yo, that was the craziest thing. I woke up and saw that the governor was suing her. Was yes, yes, yes. I mean, we heard that all the way in Texas. Like, what is going on? <laughs> like, for real. Mm -hmm. We need some help. <laughs> Send <Same> back up. <laughs> yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, what, um, to kind of take you back into early days of your career, like what are, what led you to pursuing being in this educational field? Wow. It, it's, it's an interesting story. Um, education was not my first choice. Um, although I did kind of play school growing up and I always had, uh, you know, I always, I was always trying to give speeches <laughs> to people. <laughs> and I was always like, you know, trying to be an activist. I was like writing speeches and all these kind of things. It was kind of interesting, but, um, I thought I was going to be an engineer. Uh, I started school in chemical engineering. And um, my father, my stepfather is an engineer. Um, and so that, that's what I thought. Um, however, my grandmother, who was very, my, my maternal grandmother, who was very um, instrumental in, in, in my life and molding me into the person that I am, um, she, she's an educator. She was an educator, rather. Um, she passed in 2017. But um, so she, she was an educator and um, she was very instrumental in her community in Lufkin, Texas. And um, I mean, she was active and everyone knew her. Um, she was a, basically a pillar of the community in the black community in, in Lufkin. And, you know, she was an educator and I mean, everybody, I used to meet people all the time. And they would be like, yeah, Miss Shaw, Miss Shaw was my, was my first grade teacher and was my third grade teacher. I mean, she just was like that, her and her sister. Um, they were both educators in the community and there was not a black child <laughs> almost in Lufkin, Texas that did not have either one of those ladies <laughs> as their teacher. Um, and then she went on to become a counselor and um, within the schools and um, she was a licensed professional counselor. And, you know, at that time, definitely, you know, African-Americans were not doing, you know, licensed being LPCs at that time. Um, so she was one of the first in the, pro you know, in, during that program in the 60s and doing that and um 
you know, and I, I watched her always growing up, you know, and I would do things and emulate her. And, and she was also a business owner. She owned several different businesses. She had a piano music studio. She taught piano um, all while being an educator. <laughs> right. And then she had a clothing store. And so at one point in time, she had a children's clothing store. She had a music studio teaching piano and, uh, you know, still being a pillar in the community and working in education. I mean, just amazing, right? And you're just like, when does she sleep? Which is ironic because people say the same thing to me. It's like, when do you sleep? <laughs> so, um, you know, so, and then people say I'm a lot like her. Uh, but um, I started in chemical engineering. Okay, so I'm a kid. I went to private schools most of my life until I, um, I, I did a public school here and there, but um, like second grade, I went to public school, sixth grade. Um, and then finally I graduated from public school because I convinced my parents I could graduate early um, if I switched from pr private to public, you know, um, which we'll talk about that in a moment because there was a couple of issues of the reason why I wanted to get out of private school. Um, lot centered around race and actually my hair, um, a couple of different things, um, you know, that I would love to get into. But, um, and so being, um, uh, being in that rigorous, uh, curriculum all the time, um, I didn't do well when I transferred to, when I transitioned to college, I didn't do well. Um, I had been in a kind of a protected environment, uh, and, you know, shout out to my parents. I mean, they did, they did a great job raising me. Um, but you know, I, my day was so structured all the time. Um, because I had to get up in the morning, get ready, get in the car. My mom had to drive me to school. We had to be there at a certain time because then my mom had to get to work, you know? So, um, I, I, I was always kind of structured in my life, you know, and then school all day long, rigorous curriculum. And then, you know, being picked up after school, going home, you know, doing chores, doing my homework. Um, well, sometimes <laughs> you're, you're trying to do homework. <laughs> uh, my mom used to say, you could, if you would do your homework, like you plan parties, because I could plan a party. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, so once I got to college and I was free, right? And so it was just so much input everywhere, right? Right? You know how it's just college, you're just like, Ooh, what's over there? And it's a party and I'm, nobody's making me get up. Um, you know, so if it was the first time in my life where, you know, I had to kind of be in charge of my life. And I admit, I, I had a great time. <laughs> I had a really, really great time. <laughs> so I was not doing well <laughs> in school. Um, and I just was like, I was not going to class. I mean, it was ridiculous, Walt. I mean, it was bad. I'm so shamed. Um, and I'm in education, but, uh, <laughs> so, uh, and I mean, I got down to the point, I'm gonna be transparent. I got to, down to the point where I was at Prairie View. That's why I, I went to undergrad. I was at Prairie View and Prairie View was like, ma'am, <laughs> we don't know what you're doing, but obviously you do not want to be a student here. <laughs> so, uh, I got a nice little letter, uh, that, you know, and my parents oh, got yeah. the letter. And uh, I was on academic probation. And so my parents were like, uh, what are you doing? And I was just like, I'm trying. I wasn't really trying. Come on now. <laughs> you know, you know you can... <laughs> <laughs> of course. I was like, I'm trying. I'm trying to go to class and the teacher won't listen to me. And I'm trying. Right. I'm a parent now. <laughs> so I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> So, you know, and I was like, well, I'll just change my major because I'm not meant to be an engineer. <laughs> so I changed it to nursing which is ridiculous because I don't even like like stuff like that blood and, and, and all that. I don't even like stuff like that. I have never ever desired <laughs> to be in the medical field. So I just was like thinking like, well, nurses make a lot of money. So that's what I'll do. Uh, same thing. I just, I would, I wasn't interested. So then I was like, well, fine, I'll be a teacher. <laughs> you know, so I was like, I'll just try it. Cause my, that's my grandmother. She was like, you know, education is always out there. Uh, and so I did. And I, I transferred to education to the College of Education. And while it was something like a light bulb turned on, right? And I started taking 19 hours, 20 hours, 21 hours. Like I had to, because you know, they don't even let you take that many hours, right? The courses, but I got approved to do it. And, and my grades turned around and they improved. And I started making Dean's List and I loved it. I enjoyed it. I love my classes. I love going to class and being engaged in with my professors and talking. And it, it I just kind of got a second wind, right? Um, and so now it's interesting that I have that, that experience and that journey 
um, to kind of, and I share that with students, you know, it's like, that's why you got to find what you love and what your passion is. And, um, and just because if you're not doing so well at something, it doesn't mean that you're bad all the way around. Because now I went through my master's program, had a 4.0, my doctoral program, 4.0. I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, right? Rocking it, right? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, but I struggled. I mean, I barely got out of college with a 2.6, right? Because you got to, I think you got to have a 2.5 to graduate from college, right? So I barely got out of college because once you, you know, make some Ds and Fs, it's on your transcript, right? It's on there. So it's hard to pull that up. So although all the A's and B's and those 4.0 semesters that I had, you know, it still wasn't enough, but it was enough to get me to graduate. And I graduated only as one semester later than I had anticipated. So not too bad. <laughs> That's pretty good because oftentimes, like we, like college is presented as a four year type of thing, and you definitely can be completed in four years. But like, yeah. there's a lot of people who take like five, six years. Uh-huh. So getting that letter to graduating <laughs> with only just one additional semester. That's and yeah. switching majors too. Yeah, so, switching majors two different times or was it one? Yeah, two different times. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That's pretty I mean, impressive. I, you know? I, I, and I, I probably could have become a chemical engineer. Um, you know, I just wasn't focused, right? And that's what I tell young people. You know, people pressure young people a lot, right? And put all of these demands on them. And sometimes you're just not ready. Um, I graduated from high school at 16. And I mean, I turned 17 shortly afterwards, you know, so I was super young. Um, and it's a lot, college is a lot to handle, right? So, and if you're that young going to school, (laughs) you know, you're just a little all over the place, right? Because, and it's so much, especially being in a sheltered environment, right? So you're just kind of like, especially when your life has been kind of structured and I, I had, I couldn't really move around, you know, I wasn't used to moving around, you know, on my own and being that independent. Um, so it just was, you know, overload. I was like, ooh, <laughs> there's yeah. a lot going on. Yeah, I know. Freshman year, like, um, I was on the soccer team, so there was, like, certain things that we could and could not do. So I think that right. definitely helped with, like, the guidance. But, you know, when you're first in college, especially if you're away from home, like, out of state or anything, it's just like, yo, it's just so much going on, throwing at you. You could just lose yourself. Like, I'm actually really glad I didn't go to school in a big city because yeah. I don't even know. I don't even know. <laughs> like, I was in a town, like, middle of nowhere, and there was a lot to do. So I can only imagine in like a bigger yeah, city. Yeah, well, that's where Purview is. It's outside of Houston. So it's in a, it's in a mm. rural area. There's nothing to do, but, but well, I wouldn't say nothing to do with parties. But <laughs> <laughs> it's a great school. <laughs> we know what it is. <laughs> we know. <laughs> like every parent listening, you just got to know it's just going to happen. <laughs> hey, we are the number one HBCU when it comes to homecoming, though. So I got to give, I got to give my school props. Like, yeah. like if you want to go to a really awesome homecoming, Prairie View's homecoming is the place to be. <laughs> you can set your homecoming out. <laughs> I want to take a quick break to tell you about our brand new collection called I Love New Growth. You know, inspired by the natural hair journey, we wanted to do something that both symbolizes when new hair is growing as well as the hard work that goes into growing in your personal or professional life. New growth isn't always pretty or Instagram worthy. You know, it's often uncomfortable. There's countless mistakes and just these incredibly embarrassing moments that come with it but without these moments of struggle are you really growing at boss locks we don't just celebrate the destination but the journey it takes to get there i love new growth and i'm now reminding myself to appreciate all that comes with it the boss locks shop now has new growth shirts hoodies and crew neck sweatshirts available when you go to www dot bosslocks.org slash shop or you can just go to bosslocks.org and click the shop button to place your order today that is www.bosslocks.org slash shop and we also will have the link in the description too you know i love new growth thank you for listening and now back to our show So you're switching majors a couple of different times is a very like common thing that college students go through. 
And I know I've personally seen people switch majors and it just did not work out for them either way. And it's just kind of like, there's a, it, it's, it's like a easy thing, but it's not that easy as well. Cause you're completely switching lanes, switching, like how you view, like what your future is going to be like and everything and that transition. And sometimes we do just grasp at things like, uh, like nursing. That's something like my grandma was always talked about become a nurse, but I know I'm not going to wipe any butts. So I, can't, I can't do that. But right. um, <laughs> Yeah. And it's just like um, all these different career paths that become a lawyer, become a doctor. We kind of see these things a lot. And um, after size in college, we started doing something and realized like, oh, actually, I don't really care for that. And it's like we have to figure out like, man, what is it that we're going to study next? Like it's it's a pretty big decision. So um, can you um, share? And I guess like the education kind of called to you and everything. But do you remember like what it kind of felt like changing majors? Um, initially, um, I changed majors out of desperation, right? I changed majors reluctantly. Um, and like, like I said, I, I literally was like, oh, okay, I guess I'll be a teacher. Um, you know, and I, it was, I, in my mind, I was like, it's just, it's not a lucrative field. Um, so, you know, but I'll just do it because at least I'll be able to have a job. Right. But then, like I said, once I got into the field, to the my coursework and the classes and I really liked it right it it resonated with me like um it, it was just something was just like a light bulb for me turned on and I I just enjoyed it so so much um and I can tell you that uh it's been quite lucrative for me <laughs> um probably also I can say you know um I I am bilingual so um that does help um, so I've always had great, great positions and, you know, gotten an extra stipend for whatever, you know, my jobs and, and here and there. Um, but, uh, you know, so I can say that I, I've made pretty decent salaries, um, you know, being in education. So it hasn't been too, too bad. Nice. That's what's up. So teachers can uh, <laughs> get compensated well. depending. They, on they can. Doing. They can. I mean, there's a couple of things you can do. You can tutor. Uh, you can be, uh, you know, a head of a club. Um, you know, you can do, there's all, you You know, you can monitor, you can coach, you can monitor, you know, football games or um, run the scoreboard. I mean, there's so many different things that you can do to earn, uh, mm -hmm. you know, extra money here and there. Uh, if you're in a high need area, um, such as mathematics or science, and you can teach um, in those areas, um, so you can make, you know, an extra money doing that, too. They'll give you an extra stipend, uh, getting your master's, getting your doctorate. Uh, you know, those those types of um, incentives are great. So. Gotcha. Do you see, because um, I'm kind of curious, because I know, like, in a lot of cases, teachers are underpaid. And I think every school has different types of resources as well. But do you feel as though there's um, resources that are available that maybe teachers just don't know about? Um, at times. Um, now, there is a lot of red tape. There is a lot of bureaucracy um, centered around education, and the things that we can do and the things that we can't do, you know. So um, we, we do have to work within a lot of parameters um, in our jobs. And so it, at times it can be very limiting um, <clears throat> as far as like resources. Um, there are a lot of cuts that happen that are not that are beyond our control. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that people don't know a lot like, you know, yes, there's there's the tax dollars are being collected. Um, it does help to, to fund schools um, if you pay your taxes on your home and properties um, <clears throat> and it helps to fund schools. But also, you know, you got to send your kids to school because that's where we get our money from is from attendance. And when you don't send your kids to school, you know, and they're absent at that day or if you don't give us as an excuse, you know, that really, you know, kind of hurts us. And so right now in a position where, you know, school is virtual, right? And we're trying to get people to log on and we're still being held accountable for that attendance because that's how we get our money. Um, and so, you know, we've got parents, you know, we're trying to call and get them logged on, right? Um, so, and we, we heavily depend on, on, on the attendance um, for the school. And then the other thing is there's grants that we write. Um, there's other funding programs like Title I and Title Three that come out of the federal, you know, come from the federal government and the budget with that. Um, and there's that's a whole nother conversation that I can talk about about the U.S. Department of Education <laughs> and their and some of their uh, ideas as uh, and policies as of late. 
Um, but as far as, you know, funding and, and resources that are available. And I mean, you know, also I, I got to give a shout out to a lot of the private companies that donate to schools because they recognize, but sometimes, you know, they, they can't give to everybody. Right. So, you know, as we're writing, um, writing grants and, you know, coming up with proposals and plans to try to get more resources, whether it's technology, um, or if it's just curriculum, or if it's just uniforms, right? Clothes for kids, school, like supplies, you know? Um, <clears throat> because one of the things about public education um, is that it's free for you to go to school, right? We are, that is the, the base of education is that it's available for your child, right? It's to attend school. Like if anything, if they, they are afforded an, an opportunity to have an education. Um, but the interesting thing is, but they, a lot of times we're not given a lot of resources in order to do that. So there's a lot of extra money that we have to spend. And I mean, I don't have to give you the statistics, but yes, they spend more money on, on prisons and, um, you know, prison inmates than they do on children for education, you know? So, um, it, it, it's just amazing. You know, thousands of dollars are being spent daily, you know, to, to keep a prisoner. But at the base, I think we get less than a hundred dollars mm -hmm. per day for a kid to, and that's what we supposed to, we're supposed to work with. You know, that's what we work with, with our teachers, uh, that pay their salaries. Um, and that's what we work with to, you know, fund the building, take care of the building, take care of, you know, the curriculum resources, the fun things that we do. Um, cause people forget <clears throat> that it's not just about kids showing up into the building. We got to keep them engaged. Um, we got to, you know, make sure they want to be there and want to keep coming back. <laughs> right. Um, right. long gone are the days where people just do things just because you're supposed to, right? Like, um, it's, it's a, we are a society of immediate gratification and instant gratification. Right. So, um, you know, you come and you, what do I get? What's in it for me? Why am I here? What do I get? Cause I'm here, you know, and that's just kind of the society that we live in. I mean, we can fight it all we want to, but that's just kind of how we operate. Um, even if you think back to Pavlov's, you know, dog and that whole experiment, you know, the dog mm -hmm. rings the bell, he gets the treat, right? So, I mean, it's like, I do this and I get something. Like I do it, I get something. And that and that's kind of the cycle that we work in and the kids are, are no different. And also with teachers, because right now, um, you know, we're really trying to make sure we, we, make we, we we are trying to make sure that we keep our teachers well taken care of and and that their mental health is protected you know so i'm trying to give them treats we gave them root beer floats you know one on last friday you know trying to you know wear jeans you can wear scrubs you can you know trying to just make sure that they feel comfortable you know because it's just such a stressful time right now um and we want them to know that we also care about them um and just just protecting their stability yeah. yeah, that is so interesting. And I had no idea, you know, we always think about like, we, we know, like tax dollars go to schools, but we also know they yeah. go to prisons and the military and all of these other things. Yeah, we always talk about, oh, we don't have enough money for this, but you know, <clears throat> all your cops get Lamborghinis and everything. So it's really interesting. And also to hear that the attendance plays a factor in the fundings. And I guess I could see when they made that decision, how that makes sense. But at the same time, it's like, I feel like there's, it's, it's, it, well, I don't know anything about this, but I feel like there's a lot of other factors that could come into play with choosing how to Absolutely. fund the school. But um, that's really interesting. I had no idea. So this is, um, so even like now during all of this virtual learning and everything, attendance affects the funding. Absolutely. We are still held accountable for our attendance on a, in a normal time um 95 percent is the is the threshold we have to stay above 95 percent on a regular basis um, as far as attendance and i think right now um, texas education agency is kind of giving us a little leniency um but it's still i think it's about 90 percent we have to stay above 90 percent mm. on a daily basis yeah i guess that i could see that wow well Congratulations on just being able to engage your students and good luck with the rest of the semester. I know that's quite a challenge, but um, it seems like you guys have the right energy there and it seems like you really yeah. do care for your students. So absolutely, you know, absolutely. Happens. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Now um I want to go back to well, a couple things. Um graduating high school at 16, you said? Yeah. 
Yeah. So did you kind of prove your parents right? Like you called it. That's what's up. <laughs> yeah. Like I put a whole presentation together to get out of this private school. I really did. Because I found out another friend of mine, she transferred. And so she was able to graduate early. So then I was like, you know, she did it. So here is, you know, here are the benefits. And, you know, this is what I'm going through over here uh, at this school. You know, I'm one of the few black girls there, um, you know, so it's very frustrating. And I'm constantly having to explain my blackness. I'm constantly Constantly having to explain my hair. I'm constantly having to explain, um, you know, or I'm constantly, can you dance for us? I mean, it's just like all this like stuff, you know, and I mean, just pressure, <laughs> you know, and it's just like, you know, like, hey, bro, what's up? You know, I mean, like, you don't have to talk to me like that. Like, seriously, <laughs> like, just say hi um, and I will respond. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just like all this kind of crazy stuff. Like, you know, like, oh, I just listened to this, you know, Tupac. And I mean, it's just like, Lord, have mercy, Jesus. <laughs> you know, it's just like, okay, thank you. I mean, of course, I, I do understand it's just the appreciation and trying to connect with me, uh, with my culture, because I was row row. I was cool. You know, I was different. Um, and they were, you know, they were out. I, I was a student that they had never come across before. So that I wasn't a student that were in that was in their neighborhoods. Right. Um, and the crazy thing is, I, I didn't come from, um, you know, this low income background, you know, um, I, my parents were both highly educated. They have master's degrees. I am a fourth generation college graduate, you know, so my great grandparents went to college. So like, I'm not, you know, I, wasn't a, I mean, I did have a, I think a slight scholarship just because the school was a boarding school. I wasn't a boarding student. I was a day student, but I mean, the school at that time was like $16,000 a year. So, I mean, my parents didn't have $16,000, <laughs> but, um, you know, I did have a partial scholarship, you know, so they still had to pay for my tuition every month, you know? So, um, and that was another thing I pointed out and I was like, you would save money because public school is free <laughs> and your tax dollars. All I had a convincing argument. Obviously I did. Cause I was, I was able to <laughs> withdraw from the school. Um, and, Maybe uh, a lawyer could yeah. major. <laughs> And yeah, right. <laughs> For real. Uh, but uh, yeah, so like um, just just being able to finish school early and and but just knowing that I but I will say this. I think I was able to still kind of bounce back because I had that that education that I had. Right. So I always knew the end goal. I always knew where I needed to be. I always knew I wanted to be a professional. I always knew I was going to work. I know I wanted to be highly educated, right? So, and that I was afforded that education at, at, at those schools that I attended. Um, I, I was offered, you know, lots of experiences. My mind was open um, to all types of, you know, cultural, um, you know, just cultural situations and just understanding literature, understanding science, you know, just all of those things were just on a dip, deeper level and higher, you know, in a more complex level. Um, so I think having that foundation and knowing, you know, like just a, a lot about learning and, and what we call metacognition and just knowing how to learn. Um, and I think that's what I was taught um, going to those schools. So, uh, you know, if a lot of people have that public private school argument, you know, like, are they really better? And I can say that um, as far as matriculation, um, you know, there's something that private school does offer you. Um, you know what you're there for. You know, you know, you're there to absolutely learn and, it, and you're going to get that. You know, you're there's not a lot of. Um, there's not a lot of bureaucracy when it comes to private school education because they can just do whatever they want, right? Because it's their school. Um, so they don't have a lot of time for the BS, right? So, um, you know, whereas with public school, we can't just kick you out just because, you know, if you don't want to learn or whatever, but if you don't want to learn there, then it's like, see you later. You don't, you don't have to be here if you don't want to. So it's like, we're truly out of school where we definitely want to be there. Now, I, I reached a point where I didn't want to be there anymore, but like I said, most of it was just because I just was tired of explaining my blackness and explaining who I was, you know, and just trying to help the black students who were there. And there was this battle, you know, um, kind of internally of, am I black enough? Like, and then I would, you know, hang out with my friends on the outside or my friends at church. And, you know, like, oh, you sound white, <laughs> you know, 
Um, and and then and then I would you know wear. I don't know if you remember at the time when there the Bart Simpson shirts came out, and the Bart Simpson was they was black, you know, and had locks and all those shirts, and you know Jesus was a black man, you know, and so here I am, and I'm wearing these shirts to school, and they're like, what are you talking about? Jesus is not black, and, you know, Bart Simpson is not black, and you know why are you wearing all these shirts, you know, and and just trying to. Um, constantly fight with that, you know, and explain that because I was trying to keep, keep my culture and stay tied to my culture and who I am because, you know, my parents always, you know, we had, you know, black art around the house. I knew, you know, black actors, black authors, black, you know, musicians, black, you know, athletes. Like I was always exposed to that. I was always exposed to all things black, civil rights, like, um, you know, make sure you vote. You know, these are the opportunities that we are afforded. Um, you know, there is no ceiling for us. You know, you don't let somebody tell you that you can't do something. You know, so those are the, those are the messages and the lessons that I was always taught. So, you know, growing up, I was just like, I put my pants on, right leg, left leg, left leg, right leg, whatever, just like the next person. So just because I'm black, that doesn't mean anything to me, right? So it's hard um, to enter into a space as a black person who doesn't have a chip on their shoulder, right? Because I come from an educated household, generations of educated people, we own homes. Um, so I don't have that whole chip on my shoulder kind of experience, right? I have that whole, like, I can do whatever I want, whatever I feel like I want to set my mind to. And sometimes um, people of other cultures don't know how to take that. They don't know what to do with that. You know, it's like, well, is she trying to, you know, like stage a mutiny? Like what, <laughs> like, you know, like, is she about to, <laughs> like, is she about to like, you know, start the next Black Panther movement? Like what, what, what is it? What's she about to do? You know, like who does this Black girl think she is, right? Um, so, you know, it's just a constant, like, <laughs> resistant to who I am and to prove, but no, 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 I'm not threatening, I promise. <laughs> like, I really promise, I'm really nice. Um, I'm Black, though, and I'm going to be Black, but, um, you know, I'm going to be who I am, but at the same time, you know, I I'm, I'm not going to assimilate into who you think I should be and how you think I should be, right? So it's tough. <laughs> it's really, really tough. Yeah. yeah, man. Well, that's really interesting. You know, I, 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 I didn't have the exact same experiences, but I was at a school and it was a boarding school, and I was the first black person that a lot of people encountered. So it was like a lot of interesting experiences. For the most, all positive, and they kind of, kind of confided in me later. You know, I've never met a black person before, and like, ah, mm -hmm. makes sense now. I can see all the different right. things that led up to this, but it is, right. um, yeah, it's, it's. It's kind of tough as well being like that one black person someone knows because like i don't know about you but i always like came into these spaces just thinking like man like however you view me might be how you view well probably will be how you view all black people all around yeah. the world and yeah. i'm in thinking that you know your life was like i remember actually in college someone wanted to do a documentary on me they were like part of, just got this internship the sports department and they're like oh yeah we're gonna do this whole video series and all the athletes like Walter, i want to start with you and i was like okay cool yeah i love talking about myself let's do it and um they're like yeah you know and be as raw like tell me about all the, the struggles and everything and i was just thinking like the struggles hmm <laughs> you know right i i um you know i didn't have a game system like i was late on the game system my mom wouldn't let me have a game boy you know my str oh man the struggles <laughs> i was just really like you know the, he he wants something that's not me and he just assumed right. that that would be me because that's how he just views like the black experience right and it's, that we all struggling <laughs> that we all yeah. struggling we all have food stamps and <laughs> you know uh and don't, i mean don't get me wrong i mean that does happen in our families i mean i have families you know that that live in the projects but we went to go visit them and, ha and hung out with them you know so you know saw the you know different types of things happening going on and then i went back home to my house my two-story house and my own room <laughs> you know uh, i didn't share a room with no and all that um, and I mean, you know, even my kids now, you know, like they don't, you know, have to share a room with anybody. They have their own space. Um, and I, I try to explain that to them, you know, and I try to make sure they they I expose them to other people and other family members and say, hey, listen, this is how fortunate you are. Um, you know, and not everyone lives like this. Now, it's a little different, you know, like 
um, culturally, we have, you know, more people, um, you know, that my children are exposed to, you know, and they're not just exposed to like, kind of like just black people, you know, now I love it that they have several friends, you know, who are of different races and they really don't, um, in this generation, they really don't, I think, what is it, Generation Z or whatever they're called, uh, they really don't, they honestly, it's probably the first generation where they really don't see color as a factor. They really, really don't. And it's really amazing. Um, you know, that they just, that's just not the, the initial um, factor about a person or, or a, you know, attribute about a person that they see. Um, it's just a part of them, right? That's, that's what they say. They just, oh, they're, yes, my friend, they're, they're Hispanic. They're like, they're Latinx, you know, or whatever. And that's my friend. And, and, you know, they have purple hair. I mean, you know, that's my friend and, you know, they are, they are LGBTQ plus, you know? So, you know, my kids, it's interesting to see that, that they really, you know, it's just a part of their life. It's just a part of, they really accept diversity um, a whole lot better, you know, than we mm-hmm. did or were exposed to, or were taught, to, <laughs> like we were taught to, ex- to respect the diversity, but it was more so of acknowledgement, right? It really wasn't true respect diversity. It was more like you acknowledge that somebody is different from you. And that's kind of where it stops. <laughs> you know, it's like, you don't really have an affinity for their culture or really like I try to like really understand and accept that just because it's different, that it's all right, that there's nothing bad about it. It's just different. So, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really, really interesting how, uh, as you say, Walt, they say, they just assume, you know, <laughs> that you had this right. rough background, uh, you know, and just struggling. I mean, because, you know, our parents work hard, you know, and and they want to provide their their children, you know, with great opportunities. I mean, like I said, I, I, I came from, you know, a line of just middle class background. I mean, even uh, my mom does our history in our family. We've always been landowners. Um, we were not sharecroppers. Um, and right now my mom, you know, she said she's gone to almost, um, the, you know, early 1800s and she hasn't found where my family of uh, uh, one lineage of my family that they were not slaves. So I don't know if they, she's trying to figure out they came over as indentured, indentured servants perhaps. Um, and you know, and maybe they immediately got their freedom. But um, but yeah, she said she there's one lineage of my family. And so we've never I mean, it's interesting because a lot of us have a um, I guess we said we, we same kind of thing. Like I said, we don't have that chip on our shoulder like we you know, we own property, we own land. We've had great jobs. We have education and we just don't we just don't operate in that space. Um, and, it, and a lot of us say we have that same experience. Like people are like, y'all can't be from here. Like y'all are different. Um and we're like, no, nah, we don't think so, <laughs> you know, um, but I guess we're, we're an outlier. Right. So, in, you know what people do with outliers? They kind of like, well, you know, like that doesn't fit within the norm that we're used to. So when that happens, you know, people kind of go, OK, so how do, how do you they don't know how to process that, you know, so it's kind of interesting. That is really cool. So that's wow. There's so many things that you said are just really incredible. Um, <laughs> one, the fact that your um, family is able to trace their history back to the 1800s. Cause I remember yeah. in middle school, and this is like another instance of like cultural, just, just <laughs> not understanding, but I had a teacher who asked us all to do like a family lineage, like project and trace the history. And I did what I could. Like we, my grandma, of course, she knows her immediate family, but outside of that, no one really knows what's happened past like my grandma's parents and everything. And especially like, I don't know um, how it is everywhere, but I know like in South Carolina, that whole like kinfolk thing, like uh, my grandma was raised with like another family and there wasn't anything necessarily like she knew her other family but a lot of times other families would raise their other people's kids so they could get like different right. opportunities and stuff like that and so like my grandma and my grandpa both have I think two families quote unquote. I'm still learning about the whole process but um mm-hmm. yeah it's just a lot of confusion people just end up not knowing so the fact that you were able to trace everything back to the 1800s is pretty impressive that your families were landowners potentially not even like slaves and um you have a great your great grandparents were went to college like that's 
All yeah. incorrect. That, that is black excellence. Uh, I'm going to yeah. call P. Diddy, see if he can speak with you. That's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> no, yeah. And we all went to HBCUs, you know, and, and see, oh, and that's wow. another thing, you know, trying to explain HBCUs, right? So when I started in high school, you know, having the college conversations, right? And I'm in class and they're like, where are you going to go to school? Oh, I'm going to go to Harvard. I'm going to go to Yale. I'm going to go to, you know, uh, Pepperdine. I'm going to go to Wesleyan. All these schools, great schools, Stanford, great schools, right? Okay, Roro, because they did call me Roro. Uh, nobody really called me Ronika. They were like, okay, Roro, where are you going to go to school? You know, I'm thinking about Spelman or Hampton or Fisk, Howard, Prairie View. My, I mean, my family went to Prairie They're like, huh? Right? Crickets. They don't know none of these schools. Right. So now I've got to explain these schools. Well, why don't you want to go to? No, I'm going to HBCU. That's where I'm going. Like, you know, from like third grade, like I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out like what college. And I always knew I'm not I'm going to an HBCU hands down. Like, that's where I'm going. Like, there's a school for us. It's about us. It's to, you know, and I need that experience. And so I've never had a desire. I, I mean, I I was. I had letters, I mean, letters upon letters upon letters sent to me from all kinds of colleges from all over the United States, right? I have a, in my scrapbook, like I have, I cut out all the little letterheads and I, you know, just, I, I like, I'm a novelty person, so, oh, no. but anyway, uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, so all these schools, you know, sending me, you know, because of my merit, right, academic merit in high school, and I just was like, yeah, that's great, you know. I mean, letters, letters and letters and letters of people, you know, wanting me to come, offering scholarships, all this kind of stuff, right? But I was like, nope, I'm, I'm, I, the only schools I applied to were HBCU. I just want money in the bank, have no time for them, we just pray and say amen, now that is a wrap on part one of our interview with Ronica Jacobs. You know, this interview had so many gems in it, and we haven't even got to the good part yet. I mean, this whole episode was fire, but in part two, we get to talk more about Ronica's hair journey, the show she's producing, and a topic I don't hear discussed enough, black privilege. Here's a sneak peek of part two of Strive for More with Ronica Jacobs. Just recognizing that um, the versatility that we have, that's the privilege, right? And so when I talk to a lot of students and I even my own children, I, I say, we have the ability to be so versatile. Um, we are constantly in our world because um, we understand that we have two worlds, right? So we have the world that we go out in in the public eye and we're one way. And then we come home and we kind of lay, you know, let our hair down a little bit and relax and, you know, and kick back, right? And we can just kind of say what we want to say and be us and be who we are, right? And so lots of black people, CEOs, doctors, lawyers, you know, business owners, entrepreneurs, educators, principals, <laughs> assistant principals. We are constantly in two worlds. Baby, please don't stress me. Now that is the end of our little teaser and officially the end of part one of the episode number 24, Strive for More. Part two will be released in just a few days, so make sure you're following us on your favorite podcast platform, social media, uh, subscribe to our newsletter just to make sure you do not miss when it drops. And I'm saying this partly because right now I can't decide whether it's going to be Thursday or Friday, but if you're subscribed, you will be the first to know. Now, whether you're a new listener or a day one supporter, I really want to thank you for joining me on this movement to redefine professionalism, elevate black voices, and prove that natural hair and professionalism really do coexist. I also have a cool surprise for anyone a part of the Boss Locks Village. You know, that's our Patreon community and also the number one way to support the show outside of sharing it with the people in your circle. Now, um, I, I, I'm actually really excited to roll this um new thing out it's like a whole new way to engage with the show um i'll announce it eventually to the general public but if you're a part of the patreon community you will find out today tomorrow right now <laughs> check the group and for everyone else thank you for joining me stay tuned for the new episode later this week stay blessed and i will talk to you soon
money in the bank. I just want money in the bank. Money in the bank. I just want money in the bank. Money in the bank. I just want money in the bank. I just want.